Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Interrobang, the Festival of Questions presented by the Wheeler Centre. My name is Emily Sexton. I am the Head of Programming, um, and it, it's my great honour to um, welcome everybody here today. Um, before I go any further, I'd like to acknowledge that we're standing um, on the country of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to um, elders who might be joining his, us here today, to those past and present, and in, indeed to all Indigenous people who are here in the beautiful Athenaeum theatre. Um, th today has been really fun already. We started the morning with eco economics, economics and capitalism and democracy. We've been down the road to racism across the borders. We've asked questions of um, happiness, of muffins, um, anyone who just came out of Alan Duffy's session on the universe and whether it has a memory will know that, you know, there's all sorts of poetry that we can find in, in the power of asking questions. But it really is you guys who come and join us for this brand new experiment of what a festival of questions um, could possibly be that, that really, I guess, I don't know, send chills up and down our spine because you are being so brave. And it sort of makes a lot of sense because the two women I'm about to welcome to stage are also some of the bravest people we could find who have really spent their lives writing and having experiences that are about the, art, the pursuit of, of curiosity and of vulnerability, of generosity and of risk and questions. Um, I'm about to welcome the fantastic Cheryl Strayed, who is, of course, the author of um, Wild, of Tiny Beautiful Things, and the very recent Brave Enough, as well as the co-host of Dear Sugar Radio. Um, and she's going to be joined by Megan Daum, who's The Unspeakable, is perhaps one of my favourite books of the year. Um, she's also the author of um, a range of other titles and, and really writes across a huge array of publications that have sort of a deep and lasting influence on how we think about, um, I guess, ourselves in relation to culture. Um, but that's enough from me. Please welcome Cheryl Strayed and Megan Daum. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Yeah. Hello, Australians. Thank you, yeah. It's lovely to be here. It's wonderful to be here, and I'm so happy to be talking to you I'm happy again. To, I'm so happy to be talking to you, too. I, I, we had to come all the way to Australia to I know, see to each other. I know, to have a conversation. <laughs> um, so I was just, I was standing backstage and I, I, I have been calling this the festival of unanswerable questions because I, I feel like on any given stage it's like somebody asks something and I'm like, you know, someone in a, in a Republican debate in, in the US that just has no idea how to answer right. any questions. Um, <laughs> So, and, I, and I thought, well, actually, we don't have an unanswerable question, but we do, because it is, what is it to be wild? Right, yeah. Uh, so, I didn't prepare Are we going to start off with a big question? No. We're going to no, work our I'm, way up I'm to I'm saying it. that that is, we need to keep it in That's a, the title of our, our conversation That's the title of our, of our conversation. What is it to be wild? Um, yes. So, but I, maybe we'll just sort of arrive at it, in the answer in an organic way, by, by the end yeah, of, let's of the do discussion. Yeah, so, let's do it. Let's do it. So... Anyway, I mean, everyone knows you from Wild, and many, most people know you from Dear Sugar and Tiny Beautiful Things, and now you have a new book. I do. It Brave doesn't enough. look like that here, though. That's the American edition. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Are it's, they going to be able to recognize it? If, is it it's totally, totally different. Does anyone have the Australian edition? There we go. Oh. Here. It matches my oh, let's boots. let's see. Here we All go. Right. This is Brave Enough here. In this country. So, yeah, two different iterations. Is the, is the content the same? Or it's the it's content. Totally different? <laughs> the content like is the same. These quotes are, you know, they're, they're like desi designed for Just totally. And, and this, is my, this is my actual tattoo, which they, the little horse there. Are there people up there? Hi. Um, so they asked me if they could put my actual tattoo on the cover of the book, which I thought was kind of cool. But when you buy it, the tattoo is covered up by a sticker featuring Reese Witherspoon. <laughs> <laughs> so, so she pri you pried Reese off. We won't tell Reese. Um, but yeah, so if you pull Reese's lovely face away, um, you get the tattoo. Okay. Thank you. And that way your moms can buy it because the tattoo's covered up. And That's right. Like that. So, okay. So this is a book... Of quotes, of things that you said, of it incredibly is. wise things that you said. It's a terribly presumptuous book. No, but, um, how, but how did you, who, I, whose idea was this? It was my UK publisher's idea. Oh. And what happened is this, they, they uh, 
called me up and said, we noticed that there are all these memes on the internet. And I was like, I see, hold on. And I Googled the word meme. And, um, <laughs> and I realized that I, what they were talking about is something that I had noticed was happening, which is, um, for those of you who are like me and have no fucking clue what a meme is, it's, it's basically like, it looks like a poster that you would put on the internet, right? So they would take a quote of mine and write it in pretty script or whatever with like a cool background and then post it on Instagram or Twitter or whatnot. And then people would like repost it. And, and I knew that this was going on and, her, and I also kept getting emails from people who would send me pictures of their body parts um, with tattoos uh, from phrases from my books. Oh my gosh. And, yeah, which is a kind of crazy and interesting thing. Does, does anyone here have a, a tattoo that I wrote? <laughs> that's a copyright infringement, actually. <laughs> so that was a trick question. No, but that's, and this, <laughs> this is, you know, I've been traveling around the US, and almost always there's somebody in the audience who does. And what's funny about that is never is my, like, they have my quote, but they never have, it's never attributed. They never. <laughs> They never right. have ta Cheryl Strain tattooed onto them, which, which is really uh, the reason I did this book. Because I realized... <laughs> no, 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 hear me out. What I realized is that these quotes, it wasn't about me. That the people that, who decided to put my quotes up on their Instagram page or on their butts or whatever, it was about them. Like, they made my language theirs. Right. That right. when somebody... One of the most common tattoos is... Um, how wild it was to let it be, which is the last line from Wild. And what I realized over and over again is, you know, that sentence means one thing to me, and then it means something else to the people who said, I'm going to get this on my arm, which is a really beautiful thing. And so my idea about doing the quotes book was that not proceeding from the premise that I'm so wise, so let me just show you how, how very wise, but rather here are the phrases that, that readers... Mm have found useful. And, I'm, and so I really essentially crowdsourced the book. I went to the internet. I put, you know, Cheryl Strayed quotes and Pinterest and Instagram and all and of these places. And did you find any that had been, that had been attributed to Albert Einstein with, with his picture? <laughs> At least that half seems... of his quotes yeah, are I actually mine. That. Yeah. I know, no. right? Yeah. No, but it's it happened. is interesting. The, the hardest part about being quoted in that way over and over again is when, you know, obviously you know this as a writer, you, you, you are actually th making a decision about every word. And sometimes people will paraphrase right. a quote and then it goes viral and I'll be like, oh, it just kills me because I, I, it, it needs one more revision. Or I wonder if, if they've been tweeted and in order to condense it to a, to a tweet, if it kind of took on a... Yeah, they and a bridge. They took some liberties. Way. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So, and the quotes came from not only your writing, but lectures that you've done. I mean, how, yeah. what's the range? I've been giving a lot of talks, and um, and so some of those, you know, when people would, if if I, you know, gave a talk and then people would tweet it, and then one of them, I actually, so I I was deciding whether or not to do this book when I was teaching a workshop in Maui um, in March of this year, and so I had these like 65 students, and I was saying to them, you know, what, you know, should I do this or what quotes should I use? And um, at one point when when we were um, in class. I sort of, in an offhanded way, just said, you know, the, the truth of the matter is is that we were all sluts in the 90s. <laughs> and they were all like, that has to be in the book. Yeah. So um, that's in the book. It might be my favorite quote know, of the book. I wondered about that. But what, how is the book? You're, you might, are you going to have to update it? Like, if the book is still around in 100 years? Well, see, like, it becomes one of those... The 1990s. <laughs> that's <laughs> so, right. Yes. It's a metaphor, Megan. It's right. like, you know, oh. if I'm getting all these texts, like... <laughs> From my older friends, they're like, I was a slut in the 80s, you know? And then, mm. and then the younger kids are like, I was five in the 90s. And thank God they weren't sluts. I know, yeah, well, um, that's a whole other... That's yeah. A little, yeah. <laughs> so, so I want to um, actually start with, with a quote that particularly resonated with me. And, and I think it's, it's sort of emblematic of, of a lot of stuff you touch on, especially with, with Dear Sugar. So um, I was hoping we could talk about it a little bit. Um, you say, our work, our job, the most important gig of all is to make a place that belongs to us, a structure composed of our own moral code. Not the code that echoes imposed cultural values, but the one that tells us on a visceral level what to do. So that really spoke to me, 
But I also recognize that it can be very hard to tap into that visceral voice. Right. And so I'm curious how you go about sort of talking to people who say, well, I don't have a voice. Like, I think it's very easy for us who have trusted our gut yeah. instincts yeah. to be like, oh, just listen to yourself. But what if people say, myself doesn't talk to me? Myself is, you know, how right. not to be trusted. I, th I think it, that's a, it's always a hard bit of advice to give when people write Dear Sugar um, letters to me. Um, for the column or the show, because I, I think my uh, w the only thing I can say is I think that if you don't have that visceral sense of the true inner voice, it means that you've probably spent a lot of time trying to drown it out. Mm. That you've built, you've constructed a lot of stuff um, that prevents you from hearing that voice. And I think that it can be a journey to even know what you want, especially if you've been raised. Um, in a family system or a cultural system that, that tells you that, um, that what you want is wrong, that what you want is immoral, that what you want is, is not even a question worth asking. And so, you know, I, I think that um, so often we take this kind of the safe course. My classes, when I do teach um, writing, are, and I think you probably encounter this a lot too, um, we're both in our 40s and we meet a lot of people who are at that point in their lives too and they'll say to us you're doing what I always wanted to do I wanted to be a writer but you know my parents t you know were like you really should go to law school instead you know and there's nothing wrong with going to law school if that's what I you're still might is. actually yeah exactly yes. this, this, <laughs> but you know there's nothing wrong with with that if that's if that's where you're being right. guided but if you've spent any time trying to sort of thwart who it is I think you really are. It always turns out dis disastrously. And so one of the ways that we, that we do that, if we are going to be a person who thwarts that voice, the only way to make it livable is to stop hearing it, okay? To say it's not even there. And so I think, I think if you find yourself um, adrift, the first thing is to do is to maybe take a journey, like a journey in, in, in some way that allows you to wake up again to your own life but were you, how tapped into these kinds of ideas were you as a, as a younger person, as a person in her 20s? I mean, a lot of this, it, is it right to assume that a lot of this sort of came out of your, your literal journey, you know, that you wrote about in Wild? Or, right. or were you, was this kind of like in the gestalt yeah. of you even before that? Yeah, I, I think it was in the gestalt of me. I don't know what the word gestalt means, but I think it sounds really I fucking know. good. I think it means um, like I ate something I shouldn't have eaten. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, w one of the things, it, it, writing about yourself, writing in Wild, you know, it's like, okay, you, you, you go back and you look at like, what did you do and why? Why did you do it? That was, that was a big question I was always asking myself. And um, it really did strike me that at the, at the darkest moment of my life, at the moment of my life when I honestly felt sincerely like I didn't know why I needed to be here. You know, there was no reason for me to live. And at that moment is when I decided to go hike 1,100 miles, 1,700 kilometers on the Pacific Crest Trail. And years later, of course, I didn't have consciousness of... of um, what was happening in that moment when I made that decision. But years later, I looked back and I was struck by the fact that I was the sort of person who turned to that thing in the darkest moment instead of, um, you know, something that was less nurturing, that was going to be further destructive. And I think that that, for me, you know, where that came in, you know, where that, that sort of... Um, ability to make that good decision, to, to reach for the light, if you will. It goes really way back, um, not into the gestalt of who I am, but maybe it begins with the way that I was loved. I mean, the only thing that I can say when I try to explain um, why I did decide to save myself in the end is that I really felt truly that, that I had been loved too well. That, you know, even if I could not love myself in that moment of my life, I knew what it was to really be loved. I knew what it was to, to value my own life because my mom had loved me that way. And so I think that, um, it, you know how you talk, you know, athletes will talk about they do something physically over and over again so that they, by the time they're doing it, dancers um, will say, you know, by the time they've choreographed a piece and they've done it 10,000 times, they don't even know that they're doing it. They're just, their bodies are moving in that way. And, and, and in so many ways, I think maybe 
That's what happened to me in that moment of my life. Hmm. So you trained yourself to think a certain way. I was trained by my mother, I mm, guess. Mm -hmm. I was trained by my, my mother's love allowed me to save myself in the end. See, it's so interesting. I want to read um, another quote. I think it ties into this. Um, you don't have a right to the cards you believe you should have been dealt. You have an obligation to play the hell out of the ones you're holding. Okay, so I love that. Thank um, you. And, I mean, I, I particularly like that one because it makes me think, you know, I, I've done a lot of thinking and writing about, you know, the issues, issues around being a parent, sort of choosing the kind of life you want to have. Right. Um, and, you know, there, there's this kind of school of thought, you know, people who choose not to have children are often accused of, like, having had a terrible childhood and that's why they don't want to have kids, right, which is right. absurd because plenty of people who have ch t terrible childhoods very much do want to have yeah. children. So, yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it, that is just, like, neither here nor there. But I think that there's so much freedom with th those with those cards that you're that you're dealt and mm -hmm. and sort of accepting them and celebrating them and it seems like that's exactly what you're saying because somebody else could you're saying that you sort of took your mother you know your experience growing up mm -hmm. and and saw it as extreme love but you also could have just said like oh my gosh this was like terrible and poor yeah. me and, and yeah. I don't have what other people have and et cetera, yeah et cetera. yeah I think I did that a little bit I mean that 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 quote comes from a, a dear sugar column called A Big Life, in which I, you know, somebody is writing to me saying, um, you know, that she's really pissed off that she has this enormous student loan debt. Do you guys, you don't have the student loan situation here in Australia, do you? Not yet. Um, please. <laughs> We're moving to Australia. Um, yeah. But no, it's, you know, I am 47 years old. I was paying off my college education until my 44th birthday. On my 44th birthday, I made the last payment on my bachelor's degree. Mm. Um, so it was like a huge burden in my life. I, and I, and this, is, this was me also working my ass off all through college. I had two or three jobs. I was working basically full-time and going to school full-time and because I didn't have parents who could um, pay for my college. And so I had to pay... For, the, for it myself. And this letter writer was saying, you know, was bitching about this and saying, like, I have this enormous student loan debt. And I said to her, basically, like, I feel sorry for you and I know how, what a burden it is, but the deal is about life. You know, really, the deal is about life, is that we all have burdens and we all have to find a way to bear them. And if we don't, we have a crap life. And so the best advice I could give to her or to myself or to anyone, like that, that, that it's okay to feel sorry for yourself. I certainly had a chip on my shoulder for some time about peers who had it easier, mm. who had parents who footed bills or whatever. But then at a certain point I realized, um, one, is that like that was not serving me to carry around that negative emotion, but also that there are so many things that I ended up learning about having to be self-sufficient, that I feel, as I wrote in Wild, there's a, there's a moment in the book where I have, you know, like five cents, and, um, you know, throughout the book, I'm just like constant, throughout the hike, I was constantly out of money, and I realized at a certain place in, the, in that hike that, that actually it was growing that poor that allowed me to even take the hike. Right. Because if I had grown up with more economic comfort, I would have thought what you think when you are comfortable, and that is that you need more than you actually need. And I knew exactly how much I needed. And one of the most interesting questions I get from people who've read Wild, they say, you know, but how, you know, you didn't have enough money on the hike. And I'm like, but... I did. I mean, I took the hike. Mm -hmm. Right, so you made how, it. How was, yes. the how, hike was, happened. how was that not enough? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, and I think that the, there's that difference between, we, we forget, I forget it too. You know, what is the difference between um, what we want and what we need? What makes us feel comfor comfortable and what makes us feel capable? And so, you know, I've now come to value actually that experience I had. And so when I write to somebody else and say, you know, you have to play the, the cards you're holding, um, I say it with sympathy and compassion. And, and, and also as somebody who has felt very bitter um, sometimes about the cards I'm holding, holding. To this day, I get jealous of people who have a mother or a father, for example. I do. I mean, I'm like, must be nice to have those parents, you know? And it's that little voice in me that I then have to let go of. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about what your life was like before 
the success of Wild? I mean, because, I, you know, by definition, people have fantastic success. They sort of appear. It's that you didn't appear out of nowhere. You were a working writer. You were publishing. But I think most people know you as somebody who's fantastically successful. But the fact is, you were working for decades. And I'm curious what kind of life you had. What did your writing life look like? How did you pay the bills? What were you right. doing? You know, my life... I just have nicer shoes now, um, is the main Those difference. Those are very nice. And a, yes. and a bigger house, um, and a house, and, uh, you know, all of that stuff. But, and, and, you know, I paid off, the day I paid off my student loans at the age of 44, I opened an account to save for my kids' college education. Yeah. Which was, so everything, it was like the great, this, suddenly it was like this crash where everything in that so you part were of my paying, life changed. So with, with Wild is when you finished paying off the student loans. Yes, when, when Wild. Yeah. So if you bought a copy of Wild, thank you. <laughs> um, because you helped me. Yeah, Wild was out at this point. So you, I mean, that's yes, what yeah, I, I think this is, this, people need to hear this kind of thing. Okay, because so, I think there's an assumption that if you publish a book at all, yeah. you must be wealthy. Or no. if you publish in a publication. I mean, I as a columnist sometimes get people writing to me like, oh, well, you're just sitting around in your penthouse. Right. You know, I know. A, I always, like, <laughs> it's, nothing could be further. It's always funny to me, too, when people accuse people of writing a book because they just wanted to make, you know, cash exactly, exactly. And I'm like, you are joking, right? Because, right? like, my, fa- you know, very few, even successful books, um, you know, mod- like my first book is a novel called Torch, and it was, you know, by all rights, it was everything I ever dreamed of. It was everything I ever dreamed of as a writer. It was published by a great press. It got great reviews. A, a bunch of people bought it. It wasn't an, a huge bestseller. In fact, it was not even a modest bestseller. It was just a seller. And um, but had you even been thinking and, about that when you start off as a writer? You think I just want to get published. That's right. You're that's not what you think. I want to be on the bestseller list necessarily. No, no. So yeah. everything that. So to answer your question, you know what I did is so I graduated from college and I. Um, became a waitress because it was a way for me to make as much money as possible in the sort of shortest amount of time. I didn't have to work a kind of nine to five real job. I also, it was really important to me that I wasn't working a job that, um, that I felt really emotionally invested in. Obviously, I, went, I did a good job and I was nice to my customers. But I didn't um, feel at the end of the day that I had that I had um, given what I need to give to humanity. I didn't sir. I didn't feel of service to myself or the world. And that was really important to me to feel that. And so I came home, you know, I would, I would, I would write. I mean, I wrote and I waited tables. And um, I also, you know, sometimes would write like for magazines, like articles where, you know, they actually pay you mm-hmm. $2 a word or something. Um, I taught a little bit. I, I sort of pieced it together. And then really when I was writing the books, and this is not, you know, nobody should necessarily follow in my footsteps, but I always feel like in the acknowledgments of both Wild and um, Torch that I should thank like MasterCard and Visa um, because <laughs> I went into enormous credit card debt um, to essentially fund the time to write. And I took a risk. It was like rolling the dice. I was like, should, should I, you know, pay my rent on a credit card? And I did. And it ended up being the right um, choice because then I sold my books and, and was able to do it. But what do you say to students now? I mean, I'm assuming you don't say, here's a visa application, why don't you fill it out? You know, I, I do and I don't. I say, be willing to suffer the consequences of your decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is a beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing to be responsible for every decision you make. And that was really, I mean, that was so palpable and real to me on the Pacific Crest Trail when I was hiking. Right. And because it was like every, everything I did, right or wrong, I was the one who paid for it or, or, was, or received the victory of that moment. And so I always felt like financially when I went into debt so I could write my books, I did it with a very clear mind and a very clear heart that, um, that I was doing it because writing, finishing that first book meant more to me than anything in the world at that time. And I had to see it through. And, it, and if it didn't work out the way I hoped it would, um, I would just keep working. I would just double up on my waitressing shifts and pay that bill. And so I wasn't going to blame it on anyone if it didn't work out. And I think that's a really important thing. If, mm-hmm. if you are going to be angry and tortured about making a decision like that, don't make it. 
Oh, that's interesting. I think a lot of people think about this too, and you know, a, a lot of people who are artists of some sort or another, they're like, okay, um, should I quit my job? Should I go down half time? Should I, you know, how do I make my art making fit into my money making? And and uh, there's no one answer to it. I do know that you have to make money, and if you do also have happen to be a person who has to make art, you have to find a way to do both of those things. And um, unless, unless you have a, you know, a spouse who can support you or a parents or whatnot. Um, but I think that when you think of it from a place of empowerment, like, you know, I didn't feel disempowered about going into debt for my work mm -hmm. because it was a decision I made. That doesn't mean I didn't feel scared and desperate because by the time, so when Wild came out, I had two little kids. My husband's a documentary filmmaker, which is also not a lucrative career. <laughs> You'd be surprised to know. Um, yeah. If you take nothing away from this festival, that be would afraid. Be, little, be very yes. afraid. And we had two little kids, and we were the ship was going down, you know, and um, financially. And so mm -hmm. it was like wild was like the last, you know. It's like I was like a you know gambler at the racetracks, and we and and we and it worked out. It worked out. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, I I don't have to tell you what happened with Wild. It's it's in, completely deserved, but it's in the top one percent of the one percent of things that can happen when you publish a book. Yeah. I mean, what do you think would have happened if it had been you know done fine, but been you know sort of mid list kind of book like like Torch? What what would you would you just Keep going. I would be. I would have been. I would be grateful, really grateful, yeah. that I published the book, and I would probably have be a professor at a university or college. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would have taken a job teaching full time. I love to teach. I still do teach. But what I can do now is teach on my own terms in really beautiful places like Greece. Like my <laughs> students from Greece and France are here. Hi guys. Oh, nice. Um, so now I just. But I would do that. Yeah. I would anchor myself to somebody who gave me a check every couple of weeks. And you Is went, that what, I mean, that, what do you do? I, I completely hustle. Yeah. I, I, I actually, and you know, it's funny because I have said to students, don't be a snob about the assignments that you take. I mean, yeah. I, 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 di I didn't go on an academic teaching track, but I was a journalist and I did every kind of writing possible. I mean, yeah. I wrote like, you know, for women's magazines, 10 tips for knowing if he's the one. And obviously I didn't follow my own advice many times, <laughs> but, um, you yeah, know, write, you write what you don't know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, and even... Um, did you write 10 tips for knowing he's the one? So, yeah, I mean, I work. Yeah. I mean, I literally have done every kind of magazine writing. Yeah. I mean, I even ran out of money. I mean, after I had published two books, I had written for you know all the magazines that you want to write for. And at one point, I ran out of money, and I went back and did a copywriting job. I mean, yeah. I drove to it, and I drove to the office, and I did it, and I you know paid my rent for about eight or nine months doing that. So, so I think that actually, it's you know, there's such a sort of you know, we romanticize the artist's life and, right. and, you know, the idea that, you know, if you really are committed, you will suffer or, or starve. And, and yeah. I think that, you know, like you're saying, it's, it's legitimate to put it on Visa or if you can own that and right. be accountable for that. And mm -hmm. it's also legitimate, I think, to take like an office job yeah. if you can, you know, or a waitressing job. Right. Get up at four in the morning and write for a couple. I mean, it's always, I get this question over and over, you know, and that's the thing too, is I always say to people, it's not... You know, I don't write every day. It's okay. You, you, this idea that you have to, um, to, in order to be a writer, you have to follow a set um, sort of parameters that have been laid out for you by people who have a great amount of privilege or a wife. Um, right. And I, you know, I don't write every day. Like I, you know, make it work. If it's one hour a week, if it's two days a month, if it's, you know, find a way to do it. And yeah. That's what I. I know. Me did. too. I always feel like the people who say they get up at four in the morning and and write for five hours and go to work are yeah. li are lying. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that I'm, I I would like to tell myself that they're lying. I'm sure they're not. So so I want to read another one. Um, and and I think this this kind of. It is really gets to the heart at what a lot of people who write to you seem to be experiencing, just in terms of of envy and feeling like failures in relation to everybody else. So I want to kind of talk about that for a minute. Your assumptions about the lives of others are in direct relation to your naive pomposity. Many people you believe to be rich are not rich. Many people you think have it easy worked hard for what they got. 
Many people who seem to be gliding right along have suffered and are suffering. And, you know, it reminds me of that quote that's always misattributed to, to Plato, I, you know, something like, be, be kind because everyone is fighting a battle you, you know nothing about. Right. And, you know, but when I, I actually said that and they're always saying Oh, my God. <laughs> Always like right. Any <laughs> book, any book of Plato. Actually, you you wrote. That's right. I know. He, that too got like you all look, of his ideas. Yeah, you for look me. great yeah. for your age. <laughs> um, um, you know, because I think you know we were talking about this a little earlier in the panel, and I think that we're in this moment with social media and with people, you know, curating their lives, presenting very specific, deliberately, you know, misleading versions of themselves. Right. Um, you know, really with the goal of making people envy them. Like, I feel like envy has be- is like the currency. It is huh. the currency of the moment. Uh-huh. And it's really destructive. And so I wonder, like, is that something that you hear a lot from, you know, that sort of, those sorts of issues from, from readers? Well, I think, you know, that, that piece was in re- response to a, a letter where I was asked to talk to my younger self. And that is, I would say that the, if... If I, I sound like I'm this ancient person at 47, I know, but what not, I mean she's is she's not as old we're as still Plato. like right in the middle of life here. But but what I mean is that you do learn a lot, you know, between the ages of like 22 and 47, for example. And I would say that the the, the biggest thing that I've learned that just remains true across every experience I've had, including the Hollywood experience, you know, and talk, you know, be, being friends with Oprah and all that stuff, is that you know whatever it is you've assumed about the people you think you know based on like how much money they have or how much fame they have or what they're wearing or who their you know boyfriend is or whatever whatever any of that stuff you are wrong you're absolutely wrong you know nothing you know nothing about anyone until you know their hearts and minds you know nothing about anyone until you engage with them and see who they are inside and so many people who seem to us to be you know solid and together are, are fearful and, doubt, and, and doubting and um, you know the, the, the people we envy often um, envy you it's kind of like that old thing that your mom would be like they're more afraid of you or like the you know what I mean like they're more right. afraid of you than you are of, of them and that sort of thing and it's a very humbling thing it's a very beautiful thing um, honestly to also see this so clearly in the letters I receive as sugar um, do any of you listen to the Dear Sugar Radio podcast? Yay, thank you. And, you know, you see, that, you know, these people, everyone, essentially, the, the core question is always, is it okay for me to be me? Mm. And that answer is always yes, but I think that so many of us struggle with that, grapple with that. You know, I, it's, it's like, I can tell very, cle- I can say very clearly and strongly to everyone on the planet, you know, yes, it's okay, but, you know, for me to even say that to myself is still... Um, up for grabs. It's still hard. Yeah, I mean, you say in the introduction, I'm not trying to be the boss of you. I'm attempting to be a better boss of me. Of me. Yeah. 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 But uh, sometimes you do tell people that they're doing the wrong thing. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so. I'm still a judgmental bitch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, otherwise you would have no credibility. That's so. right. You sometimes have to give people a kind of spanking. I mean, and that, that's part of the deal, right? Yeah. You know, that's... But do you think that, that the, the sort of intensity of these kinds of feelings of envy or that you're not doing it right are, are worse today because we are seeing just, just like a constant stream of other people's accomplishments? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, we were talking before we went on stage. We're writers of the same generation. We came up at the same time. But, but we were not aware of each other. Uh, when did you become aware of me? Um, is that a Do you remember? Question? <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I mean, I became aware well, of you I, because when you your have first a... book was published. Okay. Um, your collection of essays. So I was in a bookstore, and there was this... Oh, My Misspent Youth. Yeah. My Misspent uh-huh. Youth. And I bought your book. And that is how I became aware of you. And I'm going to guess you probably be- became aware... What year was that book published? 2001. Okay, so that was the same year that my essay, The Love of My Life, was in the right. Best American Essay. Yes. And I'm going to guess you read it. Yes. And that's, we became aware of each other. And then we didn't meet until tw- 2012. Right. We met 13 years later. Had right. no contact until we met in Los Angeles uh, just right. a few years ago. And I think that that is um, the way that, that we used to know each other, that writers used to know each other, but also that we people used to know each other. That, like, you encountered people in real life or you encountered artists through their work, but you didn't have any 
contact with them unless you had an actual reason to. Right. Now, you know, I have so, you know, all of the writers, um, all of the, you know, the young 20-something writers, they are in constant communication with each other on Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat or whatever. The, what are the kids doing these days? Whatever it is. <laughs> and they're all like, and they're all aware of each other and they all know that they, they, this person had this essay in this place or that place and they're reading each other, which is so exciting. It's very, um, in some ways, the, the, on the one hand, like the positive piece of that is this wonderful creative collaboration and energy and support and networking and, you know, all of that's happening. The downside of that is if you, you know, you're constantly feeling like the person who wasn't invited to the party. You know, Megan didn't know all the parties I didn't invite her to because she was like wherever the hell she was. Oh, and I, I was in really my, bad. and the writers I, yeah, and the right, right, do you know, do you know what I mean? Like the writers we knew were the people who like lived in our town and we weren't reading about their successes yeah. on the internet. And so absolutely, I think the downside of this kind of, um, I'm going to show you everything I'm doing and we're going to, you know, um, take selfies of everything, which I totally do too. We just took a selfie backstage. Um, because I want everyone to know I am fucking with her. Um, but, you know, it's like, and so it does create a kind of uh, that, 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 I mean, I think that I would have struggled fiercely, fiercely with jealousy if I had become a writer in that, in this generation, if I were, you know, 27 instead of 47. Um, I, you know, like anyone had to struggle with my own feelings of jealousy, but it wasn't, I think it's just amplified um, online. Yeah, and I mean, we were talking about this earlier, and I think this is really interesting. You know, we are of a generation where we were writing, we were writing essays, and we were writing personal things, and uh -huh. it was pre-blogosphere. Yeah. And if you wrote something and people didn't like it, or even if they did, whatever, you wouldn't hear about you it. You didn't know. Until, yeah. you know, maybe they would, if it was in, like, a magazine where people or you know would write letters to an editor, maybe you'd hear about it a month later or something. And now writers, journalists, everybody, or anybody doing anything, I mean, this is not even just creative people, like if you have a restaurant, if you're yeah. you know, doing anything, you, you're subject to this immediate response. Yeah. And I think that, that it must be incredibly paralyzing for somebody starting out. I mean, it's paralyzing for us now to some degree, I think. And so Absolutely. I always... Yeah, I mean, so do you think that you would have been a different kind of writer if you had had to contend with that sort of reaction early That's on? Such a, it's such an interesting question. And I mean, even just sitting here now, it's, it's really profound. I think we forget like how much the internet has changed just who we are. When we, when we walk off stage... Like, I know that we'll tra check Twitter, and somebody, some of you will have said something about what happened, either positive or negative, in this room. Oh, please, and it used to be that, nice. like, if you put on a really <laughs> shitty show, like, nobody, you, we didn't know. You would just all go complain about it and get drunk, yeah. and, you know, afterwards, and we wouldn't have no, we wouldn't be praised or condemned, at least, um, or it would be behind closed doors, right? It wouldn't be, we wouldn't right. be aware. And so would I be a different writer? You know, I think... You know, I don't know, but I think maybe I would have, because I will say, a lot, one of the questions I get a lot, you know, that probably the first essay you read of mine, The Love of My Life, um, which before Wild came out, it was really my most um, read piece. Like, it was the thing I was known right, for. Right, that was your signature, signature piece. And it's a yeah. very raw, very personal uh, essay about um, my mom's death and my promiscuity in the years after my mom died. And uh, it, it was just an utterly, fiercely uh, bold and, and, and terrifying piece for me to write because I actually told the truth and um, then released it into the world. And the thing that I feared is the thing that we all fear when we tell secrets about ourselves, we, when we tell the sort of ugly parts of ourselves, is that we'll be condemned. And what happened is that... Um, you know, I, I just got so much, like, we weren't on social media then, but we, there was email. And I got so mm. many emails from people saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, you spoke my life, you spoke my truth. And, but I think that maybe if I had had to sort of enter that fray where, you know, now if I publish something, honestly, within like, you know, a few minutes, I've heard from people. You know, yeah. when the Dear Sugar column would go up on the rumpus, it would be the, the, whatever time it took to read the column, and then 20 seconds later would be the first comment. And so I would immediately, it was like a drug, I would just wait, refresh, refresh, oh. refresh. Um, am I going to be loved or am I going to be hated? Um, and, 
you know, I think that if I had, you know, but, but by the time Dear Sugar came along, I at least had some confidence in myself as a writer. And also was more mature. And I think if I'd been 20-something and, like, you know, sort of afraid of that kind of judgment, that maybe I would have, you know, been, I would have pulled back. Now, you know, the flip side, and I already know the question you're going to answer now, ask me now, oh. is the flip side of this is now it's become expected. Like, when, when people write essays on the Internet about their lives, they're expected to be incredibly raw and revealing in that way right. that felt really dangerous for me. Right. Um, I remember when Best American Essays picked the love of my life, the thing they said to me is, we've never included an essay like this in the collection. Oh, gosh. And it was what he was saying to me was that it was frankly sexual and frankly emotional and frankly female. And I think he was right that they had never had an essay like that, you know. But I wonder, you know, I, I have this pet peeve about the word brave, not the way you're using it here. But I think there's this phenomenon yeah. when women especially write nonfiction and it's personal or it's touching on something that is potentially polarizing or, or sensitive. Everyone will say, oh, you're so brave right. for writing that. And it drives me up the wall because I hear that as, well, you just like, you know, dumped your diary onto right. this page or you, you know, did the sort of literary equivalent of walking down the street naked and, and oh, oh my God, I would never do that. So you must right. be brave. And, and it really, I, I feel like the word is just, it's become completely overused. And my answer is, well, you know, as, as a writer, it's our job to, be, to say the truth. We're yeah. not being brave. We're doing our job. Right. And, and I feel like that is just sort of lost in these, this equation. And part of that is because there is a lot of diary dumping going right. on out there. And so, I mean, do you feel, do people come up to you and say, oh my gosh, you totally inspired me to, to dump my diary? And, and you, <laughs> you want to say like, no, that's not how it works? Yeah, we've talked about this before because I agree with you. What I think... I don't think it's taboo anymore to write, for example, about your sex life. Like, I, I think that that can be, on a personal level, a scary thing to do, and it can feel really revealing. But to me, you know, I, I agree with you. A writer's job is to tell the truth. And I think from a generational aspect, it's also to, go, to, dig, to, to always be working to sort of dig... Um, one layer deeper than the people who before you could do. I sort of up the ante somehow, or it's not upping the ante. It's it's um, finding new ways to be brave. I do mm. I do think that you know a, a, you know thirty years ago when a woman wrote honestly about aspects of her life that now we we uh, find familiar today. Right. I think that is brave. Uh -huh. But I think that there is I think looking at um, you know what where are you actually taking risks. Um, one of the riskiest lines I ever wrote um, was when in, in Wild there's this line that is uh, m when my mother died we, uh, you know, we burned her and so there were these ashes we had to spread and I remember writing in Wild this line where I say you know, we spread her ashes and then there was this last little handful of ashes and I put them to my mouth and swallowed them and I remember, like, I think it was, like, the scariest, the bravest line for me to write in Wild. Mm -hmm. Because I, I felt like I was stepping outside of, really outside of what um, was normal and acceptable. And, and it was something that I could have easily not written, easily not told, just to stay The book is safer. not hanging on that exactly. detail. Yeah. And, and when, I, when I wrote that line, um, I had this, the first thought was, well, I, you know, I, I wrote it and then... I have to take it out, which is always an indication for me of the, leaving it in. Yeah. And so, because, and then what's so interesting to me about that, and I had to take it out because it felt like too much, but, but then I had to keep it in because it felt like too much. And uh, so many people all around the world have, have talked to me about that line. And I've also received about a dozen emails um, that say, I, I was enjoying your book, and then I got to that line, and it's just too much. It's too fucking much. <laughs> And I'm not reading the rest of your book. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Um, and I, I think it's, I mean, it's utterly fascinating because I can't even explain why it's too much exactly. I just know when I wrote it, it felt Well, the like image that. Is, is jarring. There's, it, as a visual, it's very pungent. Well, and I think that it gets at the question that we were supposed to answer, but we haven't answered. What does oh, it what mean is it to, to be, be wild? wild? And, like, I think that line is, is the answer. 
Because for me, so much of that hike and so much of the, the feeling that brought me to that hike and the stuff that I had to accept or come to terms with on that journey had to do with, um, with finally giving, giving way or opening myself up to my most savage self, my most primal mm. self. Mm-hmm. You know, when you have, you know, the, the, the ashes of somebody's body in your hands and you swallow it, that is a savage act. That is transgressive. It's animal. And it's a reminder that we are animal, that we are ruled by a kind of primal nature that, we, you know, most of the time we sort of seek to um, conceal or cover or, or, or disassociate from. And, and I felt like, um, you know, so much of, of my journey was about, like, finding my way to that and then, and then back from it, right. you know? Right. Um, when you act almost, it was almost like an instinctual thing that I both swallowed those ashes and then also wrote that line. And so, you know, I guess being brave to me in writing is trusting your instincts. And that's a phrase we hear a lot. But to actually do it, to actually do it. And when you trust your instincts on the page, and maybe in life too, what you're stepping away from is um, the possibility, like the, the, the idea that everyone should find you pleasing, mm-hmm. that, that everyone should affirm what you do or how you look or who you are. And that's a, this, it's a hugely scary leap. Yeah, and it comes back to my first question, I guess, which was, how do you even find that instinct? And I think that you are so right that it just has to do with being able to tune out all that other noise. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm curious if you have thoughts about sort of the, the relationship between wildness, however we're going to define that, and, and young women today. I mean, I'm assuming, do, is most of, your, most of the people you hear from, are they like women in their 20s? Like, is there a particular demographic? No, not across at all. Across the board, yeah. No, not really, not at all. I mean, it's really interesting, first of all, just I'll speak generationally, that, uh, you know, teenagers read wild and people in their 20s, but also, you know, all the way up. I, I would never, I would not say that um, wild is, you know, particularly appealing to, to one generation over, mm-hmm. over another. And also men, there are so many men who, like half my fan mail is from men, which I think is... Um, in part because, you know, I really, when the book, book came out, I was just so adamant that I didn't write a book for women. I'm a feminist, and obviously I understand that women find a particular connection um, because, you know, we share a gender, and there are certain stories that, that they relate to, you know, more deeply than, than a male reader might. But I really wanted to write for humans, just like you do, just like every writer in history, you know? And um, I want to write for dogs, actually, yeah. but yeah. Well, that's true, that's true. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I, I, um, I don't think that, like I never tr- aspired to make my story, you know, particular to a gender or a gender. Right, well, and you know? I think, yes, no, and that's clear, and I think that's, you know, people really, not only did it resonate with them, I think they a- appreciated your sort of not pandering to that kind of mode. Right. But what about Dear, Dear Sugar? Is what, who are most of the people who write to you there? Yeah, I would say, um, there again, we have a mix, mm-hmm. but I do have a lot of 20-something female groupies. Yeah, um, you yeah. Know, that's, with the Dear Sugar yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. And I think that that's, you know, and I love that. I also have, you know, 40 and 50. I mean, that, it's, it's hard to sort of narrow in. But, you know, I think that, that the advice is more overtly, like... Um, you know, people who are asking so many questions, which you do in your 20s, you're sort of, your whole life is a question, right? Mm-hmm. Anything could happen. Do you ever feel nostalgic for that time? Oh my gosh, yeah, because you just feel like, I, I, there is something about the anything could happen this, and I don't know if I'm just like imposing that retroactively, if right. I'm misremembering it, but yeah. I, I feel mostly not nostalgic, a little bit of it, um, because I hated it at the time. I mean, we were miserable at the time, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but, but I, you know, like, I guess I miss the, like, the aspect of it that is appealing to me. It's just that sense of, like, that, that, that you know, in every direction. Like, the, that nothing had been answered in any direction. Whether right. it be your, you know, your erotic, romantic life, your, you know, where are you going to live, or what do you, you know, you, know you, you might still end up being, like, the president Right, you could be any States. kind of person. You know, it's like, you yes. any, yeah. Yes. Just sort of accidentally win the Nobel Prize, you know. Um, <laughs> and uh, and I, I don't, though, really feel much of a longing for. But what I was going to say is that what I don't miss is that very sense of just 
so many questions. And I think maybe Dear Sugar is particularly reassuring mm -hmm. to people who are in that moment of their lives. Because I'm always saying as Sugar, you know, it, you know you're going to be okay. Yeah. Do you find um, sort of currents of, of anger and frustration among women that you hear from that maybe the contours are a little bit different than 20 years ago. I mean, you know, we're in this moment around feminism. I mean, particularly, I don't know what it's like here, but particularly in the U.S., there's a lot of rage. There's a lot of activism that's coming mm -hmm. out of that. Um, is that something that you, that come, turns out and turns up in your, in your letters? In the letters? You know, not so much. Uh, I think that a lot of the anxieties that... Um, that I would say that is maybe a very predominant anxiety. And those of you who are listening to the podcast, um, we have a, a, like a three-part uh, episode coming up about this question, which is the most common question we get. And it's women from you know, their mid-20s all the way through their mid-40s. And they're all saying things like, I've done everything right. I um, developed, you know, I traveled, I have a great job, I, t I, you know, do yoga and Pilates and, um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm just like a catch and I can't catch anyone. Mm. Nobody, I can't find the one and what is wrong with me? And I do match.com or Tinder or whatever the hell, um, all that stuff. Do you guys have th those same things here? Do you have the same plight? Um, yeah, listen to that. Mm. And how will I find, will anyone ever love me? And, you know, when, when I, I, Steve and I decided to, to answer this question uh, recently, uh, I had noticed all of these, these emails coming in that were just like, this, they could be the same letter. Um, and I thought that they were from both men and women. And then when I went in and actually looked at all the letters, they were all from women, every single one. Which isn't to say that men don't have um, romantic anxiety, but... Um, but women have a particular kind of struggle with this question, and partly because so much of we're all sort of raised on this fairy tale where it always ends with like finding Prince Charming, and right. so that's that's a really, you know, what I'm not what I'm seeing as dear sugar isn't this kind of like, um, I wouldn't articulate the kind of rage the way you are, but rather a sense of like in this new era, like the women who have done everything, right? They are the independent women who have fulfilled their own lives, but they still feel unfulfilled because they don't have a partnership. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, it's, and is it, there's sort of an unwillingness to be alone or even admit that you want to be alone. Right. Like, that's pathologized. Yeah. Well, just like childlessness. Yeah, yeah. no, and I, and I actually, or yeah. Or child-freeness. What's the term? Well, this is the kind of thing. I don't like the term child free, but that's the kind of thing that gets people mad at me when I say it that. It sounds like it's gum, just, you know, it, uh, or something. I know, it sounds like, well, it sounds like gluten free. I just don't like jargon. But, but I will admit that it's much, childless by choice is a mouthful. And, yeah. you know, it's, I don't know, whatever. We need to find a better term for that. But, um, yeah, I just, I, I think that there is a kind of um, mandate, as, you know, we were talking about this earlier in the, in the feminism panel, to sort of do everything. Because yeah. otherwise, you, you're a traitor to the cause, sort yeah. of thing. So, you know, it's not about choosing what you want, but about choosing everything. Yeah. And yeah. that's like a tyranny, you know. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, we just have a few more minutes, and then I'm going to um, take questions from the audience. But I guess I would be remiss... Uh, so get a, your questions as a, ready, as guys. As an interviewer, yeah, get your get your unanswerable questions ready. Um, so I, I would be uh, remiss as an interviewer if I didn't ask you. You have all these famous friends now. <laughs> you have Reese Witherspoon, Laura Dern, Oprah. This is a two part question, I guess. <laughs> Which of them do you like best? <laughs> And why should we not hate you? <laughs> oh my god, that is so great. That's that is the, so great. Um, that's my. Yeah, that, and those are totally answerable, by the they way. Are, they so are. yeah. Well, I'll start with why you shouldn't hate me, um, because believe it or not, and this is what I mean when I say you know we have these ideas of like who people are, and then you and then you meet them and you realize that. It, we, we all have an idea who we, like famous people, and I caught myself, it, it's been really a great re-education for me in these years that I've become friends with these wildly famous people. Because, wildly famous. Because <laughs> that's how to be wild. That's right. Hang around with but Oprah. They, but they turn out to be actually, um, 
you know, real people. And, and, to, and we, when I'm getting to know them and seeing them for all their realness and their, you know, their, all of their humanity and their fragility and their strength and, you know, all of that stuff, their contradictions, I realized, you know, how much that I have projected onto famous people and thought I knew, you know, um, you know for example, I, I, I just assumed that George Clooney didn't want to go out with me. You know, and um, did he ask you out? No, TC. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. But what I mean is, what I mean to say is, we project these ideas about people we don't know, and we do that, you know, with each other in the room. But we also, we really do it with famous people. Yeah. And so uh, it's been a wonderful experience. I think that part of being friends with super famous people is letting go of this idea of them as famous and just meeting them where they are. And that was one thing Oprah and I really connected right away because, well, and Reese, all those guys, you know, because it was, I didn't do that like sort of star thing where I was like, oh my God, I'm, I'm talking to Oprah. You know, even if I was feeling that inside, I, I decided not to kind of pay that any mind mm-hmm. and then those they just opened themselves up to me and it was a very kind of ordinary exchange and so um you know i do have great respect for all three of them and i love them and they have become friends um d- terrible things my my daughter uh, clogged oprah's toilet by having a little episode my she has also vomited in reese witherspoon's bathroom and so we're all waiting. these people only have one bathroom we're too, waiting so it's really it's a problem <laughs> we're waiting to see what happens at laura dern's house with my daughter but you know it's like that kind of real sense of taking them where they are on, their, on the human level. You know? Wait, I want to get to this. She clogged the toilet. Did she come out and tell Oprah? Or did I, she was say, with, like, I was with my daughter. This is embarrassing and I had I just, She her. just put too many like, t- tissues in Yes, and I said, you must behave very properly at Oprah Winfrey's house. And we were there five minutes, and we were having a flood in, in the house. <laughs> it's a true story. And how did Oprah uh, react? We, we made Oprah not aware of the situation. Oh, come on. Because I went in there with my bare hands, and... Uh, <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Let's just say that I, I gathered a lot of things and put them in my very large bag. <laughs> That's like, a true story. Like wet you know, Sometimes we like, got to have a drink, and I'll tell you the whole crazy ass story. It's so funny. No. Let's just say I put shit in my purse. Um, <laughs> my daughter's shit. This is why it's a good idea not to have children, because you actually... <laughs> Are you kidding? I'm not kidding. I actually reached in with my bare hands to Oprah Winfrey's toilet and grabbed a big wad of crap out. I would, I would have a child just so I could tell that story. And I wound it in a lot of toilet paper, and I stuck it in my purse. Because we had just arrived at Oprah's house. It was, I was mortified. It's true. <laughs> Your daughter is going to have such a good college essay, though, now. So I know. She's going to get in anywhere. She's going to be so mad at me. I told you guys no, the story. No, no, no. She's gonna, this so is going to pay a, off. She had a similar episode at Reese's house. Right. And then my husband and I were like, what's going on here? There's like a theme. You know, she's, yeah, she has so. gestalt. She yeah, she has a gestalt. Problem. Problem. Yeah. Yes. But okay. so, no, but my poor daughter, because they were so, my kids, we were, we were like, okay, you have to, you know, this is, but th- that's the other thing that's so amazing. So my kids, they don't, like, we had to say to them, like, okay, Oprah's this wildly famous person. <laughs> know, really. And um, they are like, she's this nice lady they know. Uh-huh. Um, when when my, my son, one of my favorite things, and this tells you so much about Oprah, too, um, uh, for Christmas last year, I gave my kids, they got iPods. And so they're, of course, like, you know, they, they are doing all this emoji stuff. They downloaded, like, every emoji that exists. And they would, like, they, like, would text me every emoji. And, um... <laughs> And the, my son found that there was an Oprah emoji. And so he texted Oprah her emoji. <laughs> and he said, Oprah, I, I found this emoji. Isn't this cool? And within like 30 seconds, she texted him back and she said, Carver, that is my favorite emoji. So you're, how old is your son? He, he's 11. He was... And he has Oprah's cell phone number. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. And I don't... she always texts them back. She's really sweet. Oh, that's she's a nice. good, and, and it's because she's a person. Yeah. It's, she's not a famous person. She's a person. And I think that the sooner we can kind of remember that about, about everyone, everyone f- from all ends of that kind yeah. of spectrum, um, the better off we are. Well, and she's a brilliant communicator. Yeah. And clearly it comes from a place of actually connecting. Yeah, and she's people. a mad so, texter. You yeah. know, she says. Wow. Really? She loves to text. What about Hillary? Texts from Hillary? No. No. <laughs> no. no. Okay. 
Um, all right. Well, I don't think we can top any of these stories, so I'm going to stop and um, turn it over to uh, you guys. You know, I just want to say I've never, from a public stage, told the um, shit. Well, Oprah we're in story. Australia. I've never told anyone. I, I tell my friends like about putting shit in my purse um, at Oprah's house, but. We're, we're pretty far from Oprah's house right now. <laughs> we're about as far geographically as we could get. Although maybe she has a house. I have to tell Oprah that story now. No. Now, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wow, okay. I want to hear that Enough I time hear that has passed that I can tell her. Yeah. Right. Tragedy so, plus time is comedy. That's right, that's right. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, I'm starting with a serious question, which doesn't follow on very well from shit in your purse. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I, I was just thinking as you were speaking about before about returning to that idea of being wild. Do you think that being wild is something we're concerned with because we're too comfortable, because our lives aren't actually wild anymore, because it's that kind of idea of, you know, people who are dying of starvation don't have stamp phobias. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that it, one of the most interesting things to me when I was um, writing Wild, I, I, first of all, I want to say, yeah, absolutely, I, I think that, that we have gotten really far from our uh, relationship to the natural world, and we forget that we are part of the natural world. You know, we forget that we are animals. I've said that now twice today. It's like, you know, we actually are animals and um we we share so much in common you know we, it is not us it's not man versus nature it's like um so much of wild what i wanted to do was write about uh being part of nature and i even say you know over and over again like the trail began to feel like home to me and i meant that really like actually and and i think that um you know the closer we can get to that having that feeling uh the better off we are as individuals and as as a people um, and certainly in this time when more than ever we need to be considering ourselves as a part of like a, a, like a global ecosystem. We've gotten away with not doing that for so long and it's, um, you know, we're going to, we're suffering the consequences of that now. Um, but I also think that what I was going to say is uh, that one of the things when I, I, I didn't do a lot of research when I was writing Wild, but I did some and I was especially looking at um, the people who, who, essentially made the Pacific Crest Trail, who advocated for it, who went out there and cleared um, you know, a, a, a corridor through, through the wilderness. And I found um, that a lot of these, these people who, who made this trail, uh, in the talks they would give trying to convince Americans to get behind this idea, is they would say, you know, and this was like, you know, a hundred years ago, they'd say, we've, we've, you know, we're too comfortable and we've lost our connection with nature. And now all the kids, they're just sitting around, you know, Playing checkers, you know, and um, <laughs> and and it was really striking. Like the, it was very contemporary, a very sort of contemporary argument um, that they were making a long time ago. And so I think that we've always felt this way. We've always been alarmed by our continuing, uh, continual disconnect from nature. Okay, I still can't see anyone. Is there, there anyone? On Hi. Oh. Hi. Um, so you give a lot of advice to a lot of people. I just wanted to know where you go for advice and help? I have a wonderful husband who I've been with for 20 years and um, he's my best friend and my greatest advice giver. I have also just amazing friends, just truly great dear friends. Um, I also go to literature. I, I, when I advise people as sugar to go read 10 books of poetry five times um, because it'll make you a better person, I, I, I take my own advice. The greatest consolation uh, has been given to me through other people's books and poems and essays. And so I really, um, I turn there. I turn there for that kind of wisdom to art, movies, all kinds of art, music. Um, that's where I go. And up there, hello up there. Okay, there you are. Hi. You're blinded. Yes. <laughs> hello. Um, it feels like a lot of your, a lot of the people that are asking for your advice are uh, asking two questions maybe at the same time, how do I like myself and how do I love myself? And um, I was interested in if you think you've always liked yourself and always loved yourself, and if you haven't, how did you get there? I don't know. Um, 
I don't know. I, I think that it's it's such an interesting and abstract idea. This um, this feeling, like you you know, we always you say these things, like you have to love yourself before you can love somebody else, and and yet we see people um, not doing that. I know a lot of wonderfully loving people who don't love themselves. Um, I think that I it goes back to I you know I really think that basically it, your parents are so important in this in many regards, but essentially in the the, the one where they do t they by loving you the way parents are supposed to love you, which is unconditionally and with that sort of full throttle abandon. This idea that they would I mean you, when you have a baby you actually have to make great sacrifices so it just can simply survive, and and I think to be on the other end of that um, informs us and shapes us forever. It, 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 it either enables or, dis, it, or disables us from um, that, that essential love or like being easy or hard. And, you know, the people who have had to go on the hardest journeys, and I'm not one of them, um, have been people who have been wounded by both parents, who, who didn't get from either parent. You know, I didn't, I had a, ter I have a terrible father. Um, and, and, you know, his, his dark legacy in my life has been enormous. And it's all in that sort of, um, it, it's in, that's where I've had to really struggle in my life to, to heal that wound and, and, to, and to feel okay with myself because I didn't get that essential thing. But what saved me is I did have that from my mom. And so I think that it's, um, it really is an almost, um, it's part of that primal, again, going back to that, the, the nature of who we are. It's, it's there. And when we don't get that, when we don't have that living in our bodies from the beginning, we have to be really strong and really honest and really brave and find a way to give it to ourselves and our lives. It's, it's not something I can instruct somebody in doing or answer from a stage. I can just say I've witnessed um, that kind of sorrow and I've also witnessed that kind of redemption and healing in my life and others. Anything up there in the way high? Highway, yeah, we really can't see you. We are blinded. Yes, hello, whose turn is it? Are we on, on is there anybody at the mic on the second level? Okay, Th third level? We don't wanna leave anybody out. I don't think, I think this guy here. Okay, hello. Hi, is this, hi, how are you? Good, I, I, I've got to say, this is a, a dream I don't think I did ever have. So I'd like to thank you both for your respective bodies of uh, bodies of work. Thank you. The questions, um, the question that I had was largely addressed um, on your side, Cheryl. It was about the love of my life and about the, I guess, the wildness of facing the repercussions of the level of truth that you um, displayed in that piece of writing. Um, you know, at one point the sentence that leaps out for me was always, uh, you know, at one point you write, you know, you write, um, I was a piece of shit. And it's just such an astonishing, um, astonishing sentence. Um, Megan, in your, um, your piece, Variations on Grief, uh, where you write about um, a friend of yours who died, whose parents, I'm assuming, were still alive, and you summarise his death at one point by saying, um, I... I you know, you essentially say that you you don't think his life was worth that all he could have ever done was was die, and so um, the question that I had, and as I said, Cheryl sort of addressed those repercussions about writing truths like that. But I'd like to hear from Megan about the repercussions of writing a piece like Variations <laughs> Variations of Grief mm -hmm. um, and the impl the implications um, for you, given that you wrote it early on, if I can yeah. say that, in your career where you're trying to get a leg up and trying to kind of find a voice maybe? Yeah, you know, that piece, gosh, I, I used to, I've, I've lost a lot of sleep over that piece. Um, it's an essay that I wrote in, oh my gosh. Pro, well, you know what, I was in MFA program, I was in grad school when I wrote it, so it would have been 1995 at the latest, um, and, you know, I don't like to talk in these terms, but that was one example where the piece just kind of descended upon me, um, and it's a very brutal piece about this friend of mine who died of really of a kind of freak illness, he had the flu, and all of a sudden he was in the hospital, and all of a sudden his lungs were failing, and he was 22 years old, and... Um, yeah, and it was about, um, you know, it was really about me as the narrator sort of 
um, indulging these really sort of cruel thoughts about um, what this guy was doing with his life and just sort of the way his parents were coddling him and enabling him to sort of do nothing with his life. Um, and I was, you know, I hope in the piece that, that you know, it was, it's clear that the author is is criticizing the narrator. You know, I'm not just saying, you know, hey, everybody, my friend is a loser. It's really much more, you know, there's many more layers than that. Um, but yeah, in terms of the re repercussions, um, I never expected that that piece was published in a very tiny literary journal. And just through several, um, I never intended to publish it anywhere where anybody would see it. So it was published in this tiny journal. And then just, I gave like a reading at the KGB bar in New York of the piece. Again, you know, like only the people in the bar. And then they ended up making a, an anthology of pieces read in that bar. And then the anthology was reviewed in the New Yorker. And then the review singled out that piece. And all of a sudden it was like, oh my gosh. And by this time, a couple of years had gone by since I'd actually written it. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I have really no satisfying answer. I felt, I felt terrible about it. I felt terrified of running into this guy's parents. That was not their real names. Nobody's real name was in that piece. Um, and I, I, I have really nothing like literary or wise or redemptive to say about that. I, I still, it still haunts me. And the same, the piece I wrote about my mother, which is like the only sort of, you know, as brutal kind of essay um, that I've written ever, um, I also am I'm haunted by it, I have to say. I am. So, sorry. <laughs> There's, maybe you could help me. I don't know. <laughs> I can help you, Megan. Okay. No, um, so, and this guy's, I, I remember, I, I think that this was my This is a very old piece. Yeah. No, that was because it was in your first collection. Yeah. Was, yeah, and then I put it in the collection. I was like, what the hell now? I mean, yeah. it's out there, so I might as well put it in. Did, yeah. did the guy's parents ever? No. Yeah. No. You know, that's, that speaks to, again, this, um, just the difference, because I know exactly what Megan means when she says it was published in a little journal, and so like we, we used to really be like you had a sense that like you knew that like maybe eight hundred people who were going to read your work in like the whatever review you know right. and and you were about right that that was the number of people who read it and um now oh, with the gosh, internet, no, it's like anything. It's like a it's like a wildfire. Anything can you know, anything can happen to it, and it can travel very far. Um, and you kind of expect it to. Well, and that I think I don't think I would have. I certainly would not have published that piece in this media climate. No, no way ever, ever. Um, so you, uh, yeah, and you would have gotten a lot of shit for it. Oh, and and deservedly so. I yeah. mean, I think, and I also think there's a. You have to, like you're saying, consider your audience. I mean, I think I would have been much too protective of everybody. I mean, it sounds a little bit, it's a little hypocritical because it's that you wrote it, so it's not like you wrote it less because fewer people read it. Yeah. But um, <laughs> it's you know, there are there are consolations in being and in, in nobody reading you. So there are advantages <laughs> to that. Yeah. yeah. The days of your the days of your yes. yes. Hi. 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 My question is, how, ta how wild is too wild, and how do you know when you've got there? <laughs> oh, there are so, so many <laughs> ways to know that you've gotten there. Um, <laughs> Megan? I, I think when you, yeah. Like a horrible hangover? Yeah, waking up, <laughs> like waking up with somebody whose name you don't know. Yeah, that is probably too wild. Though it's fun. Um, uh, th there are, you know, any number of, of reckless... I, I think that, you know, to answer it seriously, like, you know, uh, uh, when, when you have reckless disregard for yourself and others, I think that that's t too wild. I think that that's... I mean, I, I always... It's like too... I always hesitate to say to this or that because I think sometimes people learn from that too, you know, so much about... Um, you know the way we learn is like testing the outer limits the, the, the whole reason my my kids you know to use this whole the parenting thing like you know you teach the kids and they're like don't don't touch that don't touch that and you know in the, like the only way to guarantee that my kids will touch something is to tell them not to touch it and um i think i'm not alone in that and i think that's that's again that's uh, that's human nature and so i think some of us you know we have to learn the hard way um I know I certainly did. And I think that that, you know, what that entails is sometimes doing the things that, that you regret later or that maybe you wouldn't have done if you thought better of it. So 
I say, do a little bit that's too wild. That's my advice. Maybe, maybe it's if, when you keep doing something yes, that you know it, it's too wild. Exactly. And, you, and that, that's, that's right. right. That's right. You've, um, you've, what do they call it? Jumped the shark on your wildness? Yeah. You guys don't even have this well, expression. Well, when you continue to, you. to have like, <laughs> negative consequences yeah. over and over, like, you know, that's, that's when it's too much. Yes, is there someone up top? No, nobody? Okay. How about here? Hi. Hi. Um, I read your book because um, as, a, as a sort of consolation too, and I, um, to try to better understand the nature of grief, I guess. And uh -huh. I do wonder whether at the end when you actually finish the hike, whether that's when, do you actually feel like there's a cloud uplifting or do you ever get there? Or, and uh, do you, oh, sorry, another question. Um, <laughs> That, is there a part of you that feel like you are at your wildest when you are actually grieving because you're, not, you're so much overwhelmed by it that you're no longer restrained by what's accepted, what's not accepted because all you see is that darkness. You, yeah. I mean, isn't that equates to that wildness? You don't really care anymore. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think to answer your first question, I certainly... One of the things I was really interested in doing when I was writing Wild is, is uh, writing about transformation in a way that that seemed true to how we experience transformation in life, which is to say that it wasn't, um, you know, suddenly I reached the bridge of the gods and I was like, I am healed, you know. And we've seen that over and over again in uh, movies and in, in other, mostly in movies. Um, and it's, it's a kind of... Um, I think it can be really consoling to us because we think that like once, you know, it's like once we get to that place, then we're free of whatever pain does. And the, really the greatest revelation to me in my life has been the idea that, that when, we, when something has made us suffer, um, it will always make us suffer. That there is a way that we, you know, our genuine suffering is something that we have to learn to carry with us. And that we, learn, that we learn how to carry beauty and light with us at the same time. And so for me, my, my, you know, the, the, the healing or that transformation or that journey, it wasn't about um, obliterating or, or, or even letting go of a truth or a feeling I had. It was learning how to carry it with me with a, a greater amount of grace and acceptance and surrender. Those words, acceptance and surrender, like these are very, we think of them as, I mean, I'm even sitting back in my chair as I say them, because they are, they are like the, 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 the things we sort of receive. And yet I think there's a great amount of um, strength in being able to receive. Because when we do that, what we're doing is we're, we're actually burying it. We're not denying it. We're not trying to cover it up with something. Um, we're, we're actually holding it. And when we hold it, we can make it all kinds of things. We get to define the terms of our lives. And for me, you know, bringing, bringing my grief into the world has actually been a very positive thing. I mean, so many people have felt consoled by the simple thing of me writing honestly about the sorrow and, you know, I have over my mother's death and the love I have for her. And I think that that's a way where you turn something ugly into something beautiful. And I think to answer your second question, that idea of, um, of us being our wildest when we're in grief, absolutely. I mean, I think that whenever we're, you know, we ha we're upset about something, we have a broken heart about something, our, you know, our, when our lives have been split up apart in some way, we're, we're more awake um, to the world around us and to the world inside of ourselves. And for me, making art replicates that. You know, that's what I, I try to go to that place of openness, which is brokenness, essentially. And remember, again, that kind of intensity of spirit and emotion in life. Um, and, you know, that's... that's uh, I don't want to go... I don't seek out pain. But there, there is... That is the upside of pain. That is the upside of turmoil, is that you're a lot... You, know, you, you actually get to see things that you maybe were blind to before. That's beautifully said, and we are out of time. So oh, thank you. It's a great place. Thanks, thank everyone. you. <laughs>